the lectures on essentially on ethics um, and architecture. And this evening's lecture is, which is called Materialism and Morality, is going to be given by Patrick Schumacher, um, which of course then deprives the lecture of its most persistent questioner. <laughs> <laughs> because he'll now be having to give the lecture rather than uh, challenge it. Um, so it's your responsibility this evening to take over the role in the audience of Patrick Schumacher, who has to be up here. Um, Patrick, as you know, uh, teaches together with Brett um, in the graduate design and has been linked for a long time uh, with the AA. And on your behalf, it's very great pleasure to welcome you to give this lecture, Patrick. <clears throat> yeah, thanks a lot, Mark. Is it visible or audible? Yeah, okay. <laughs> um, I have to apologize at the very beginning uh, that I will have to go through this by reading a text or going pretty closely alongside a text because the issues I'm trying to talk about are pretty difficult and I haven't given a public lecture on this before and uh, although I know that in, this, in some ways or another the content of this very lecture would, would, would have required me to do something else but then again the content of this lecture will also give maybe the means of um, criticizing why one might feel having to be cautious in, in, in operating in uh, certain institutions today. So, um, but I also feel I'm very grateful that I had this opportunity to talk about a few things which I um, been thinking about for quite a while. And um, when I was asked here within the graduate school to speak in, in this kind of lecture series on ethics, it dawned on me that I should use this opportunity to venture across the limit of a maybe purely academic exp uh, exposition and. Um, as it were, come out and expose my political and philosoph philosophical position to your criticism. In fact, to do anything else at this occasion would have meant a betrayal, and that might be a moral term, which is also, I think, redeemable as a kind of materialist question of project. It would be actually the abandonment of a project I still uh, um, hope to, at some day to participate in. Um, some of you might already have witnessed that I'm operating from a fairly consolidated theoretical position. Uh, that is Marxism. And I would also like to call myself a communist. But what can, the, can that mean today practically? I'm not an activist, although there are still a number of organized Marxist groups in Britain, and I have been in loose contact with quite a few of them over the last 10 years. But I have chosen to focus on trying to build a career in architecture, professionally as well as academically. But in this process, as it were, I continue to suffer from capitalist class society. Or to put it more positively, I continue to gather and evaluate experience under the spell of the Marxist hypothesis that there could be another superior socio-economic and political regime that would, would allow me and us, all of us, to engage and collaborate in more democratic and more productive relations. And the dialectic of the moral aspect of this and, and how it resolves in the kind of scientific material analysis of history is one of the topics which should transpire in the talk. In order to mediate and share here some of the resultant speculations and insights, I mean, of this perennial attempt to think through what I am doing, my life experience, my work experience, in terms of you know, how it might be limited by political conditions we all live under. Uh, to share some of this insight, I want to pick a series of issues which seem to fit into a lecture on ethics, the arbitrary starting point in a way, or not quite arbitrary, um, in order to demonstrate how from a Marxist perspective every issue and problem can be driven to expose the political barrier to its solution, which I always see because I'm looking for it. And um, that has been a little bit also the attempt and, and habit of, of, of in some of the contributions lately that I try to see where the political position uh, uh, might lie if one thinks certain agendas and positions through to the annoyance of, <laughs> to a certain extent, to the annoyance of some of the uh, people who had to uh, witness that. The first issue I will raise is the question of the disciplinary boundaries 
in the organization of knowledge and professional progress. And that's not an arbitrary issue, that's an issue which concerns all of us as knowledge producers and um, people who, on the one hand, build careers, on the other hand, try to contribute through this to the progress of um, the profession, at least. One might point out here that, uh, <coughs> that in all professions, disciplines and specialist knowledges, the most advanced proponents in each discipline, and this is a purely empirical point right now, consistently find themselves rehearsing and potentially challenging philosophy. Philosophy at its best is nothing other, that's my claim, than the attempt to address and work through the general questions of method and purpose which arise in any research or systematic activity. And the notion of purpose is already kind of political content for me, ultimately. Any innovative and rigorous specialized inquiry or practice will move beyond provisionally useful but ultimately arbitrary disciplinary boundaries and tendentially will have to recuperate, synthesize and advance the systematic totality of knowledges, experiences and practices. At that moment, uh, in, in parenthesis, I, I do link the regressive postmodern ideological abandonment of totalization to the political hegemony of capital in this period. It's addressed to Lyotard and uh, certain figures which have prominence also in this school as an intellectual uh, authority. The very notion of architecture versus mere building seems to call for innovation and theoretical grounding. Great architecture was always innovative building and what we call architecture, always, since the Renaissance, comes along with theory, most notably since modernism, postmodernism, deconstructivism, etc. That is what we expect from ourselves as ambitious architects and from architecture versus mere building. That it knows what it is doing and that it can make an argument for itself. But such arguments have to reach beyond architecture. Architecture can have no value in itself. That would be fetishism. That means that once you enter architectural theory, you're already on the drift towards deterritorialization of the discipline and totalization, which for me becomes a political uh, uh, concept. Architecture and urbanism, just to talk about two disciplines which are neighboring, have been and have to be theorized as facilitating society, the good polis, social progress, institutional innovation, manifesting contemporary cultural values, moral values, etc. That's what we all expect. That's what we, this knowledge we do share, I suspect. <coughs> all of which obviously transcends the bounds of the expert knowledge required to, to merely build something. The exercise and transmission of routine operations within the profession are of course also part of an architecture school agenda. And as such exercise, and such exercise rests comfortably within the discipline's boundaries. That's what the discipline is eliminating, routine operations. The rationality of these operations might safely be taken as corroborated by their pervasive survival and reproduction. When it comes to critique, innovation and the formation of new practices, and the AA as an academic institution does and should claim such ambitions, a responsible account of these practices has to transcend the disciplinary realm of specialized and professional expertise. In the place of the guarantees of a corroborated standard practice, an anticipatory theoretical speculation is required to ascertain, predict, or at least bracket the effect of new architectural repertoires on the social relations and the life process in general. Um, and this would ultimately require architecture, sociology, business organization, economics, and political theory to be studied in their dialectical relations. And to a certain extent, of course, this institution is uh, up for it, and we try to do this in, in our graduate school seminars as well. But there are obvious limits to this. And uh, I would say that since capitalism atomizes the relevant decisions, such integrated science has no real audience. Such integration already fails relative to the disciplinary neighbors of architecture and urbanism that disciplinary boundaries might be useful for routine operations embodying an economy of complexity reduction, but are incompatible with innovation and progress can be seen with regard to the relation between architecture and urbanism. The disciplinary boundary between architecture and urban planning is obstructing innovation in both disciplines, and thus of the rational development 
of the built environment. There exists, and this is just one example, but close at heart, I guess, for us. They exist as two separately institutionalized practices arresting each other in mutual deadlock. Whereas urban planning is limiting its options in advance by always already presupposing the same set of building types as given from outside of its domain, like office tower, detached houses, uh, etc., as the basis of its planning strategies, which are then zoning laws, etc. Architecture, in turn, finds its narrow limits in the planner's prescriptions. So each of them takes each other's work for granted and therefore cannot be uh, uh, dialectically um, um, resolved into kind of a, a new dialectical relations. The two disciplines hold each other back instead of propelling each other's progress. But to stop at an integrated architecture urbanism would be equally arbitrary. Ultimately, the built environment is only one subsystem, subsystem of total social material reproduction. <coughs> Innovative architecture thus requires transdisciplinary theoretical speculation to assess its possibilities and effects and to establish a criterion to identify the new as innovation. More questions might arise, and in the last analysis, a political theory seems to be inevitably presupposed. To go back to the separation between architecture and urbanism. This separation of discipline is not a theoretical deficiency, a deficiency that we haven't been able to think that uh, they should be thought together. Um, the polit political economic agents of the respective disciplines are categorically separated politically. Architecture as private, urbanism as state matter. The categorical di dichotomy between architecture and urbanism, between house and city, is specific to capitalism, where only the unavoidably collective connecting infrastructure is socialized and democratically planned. All other decisions are privatized and therefore atomized, and not to be brought under the spell of a kind of uh, uh, total uh, discourse uh, between uh, architecture and urbanism in a kind of dialectic. Um, the theoretical quest for a comprehensive science of the built environment faces a political <laughs> barrier here. The and modernism is a good example of that, I would say, the 20s modernism. The revolutionary modernism, or urbanism, of the modern movement was unleashed by the post-First World War social revolutions in Germany and Russia. And inasmuch as it remained unfulfilled, it was limited by the limited and compromised character of the revolution in Germany. And I want to generalize here and make the first political statement, or maybe it's already, I, had ma I made some. In the last analysis, the solution to any technical problem also involves the political and is up against the political power structure that systematically blocks progress. And this is the rationale behind my attempt to push academic into political discourse. The underlying hypothesis is that more than ever, the technological, organizational, and cultural resources are in place to construct a higher, more democratic, and more productive form of socioeconomic and political organization beyond capitalist class society and imperialism. And this is the underlying rhythm of this lecture, which will recursively drive the issue it engages towards a totalizing political statement. I want to go back now and... and um, rehearse materialism as it were in practice where, we, where I try to recuperate from materialist perspectives a history of styles, aesthetic categories, and then come to kind of ethics categories or ethical categories. Architecture is usually seen to be concerned with aesthetics rather than ethics. Some remarks on the relationship of ethics and aesthetics might therefore seem appropriate here. Ancient Greek philosophy is said to, ha to having naively identified the good and the beautiful and Kant seems to, be strictly, seems to be strictly setting them apart. And we all know the bad conscience that comes with the indulgence in pure aesthetics and the pursuit of the beautiful. Earlier this year, I gave a short paper on what I titled The Dialectic of the Aesthetic and the Pragmatic. The paper contains what I would call a Marxist, that is a materialist analysis of aesthetic regimes, an analysis which I would like to extend here 
also to moral regi regimes in the course of that lecture. I quote from my paper, which I delivered at the 150th anniversary Datascape um, Symposium. Within a consistently materialist outlook, aesthetic regimes have to be analyzed as sublimations of an underlying performativity. At the root of any style or typology, which goes beyond the drawing board and effectively shapes the built environment, lies an economic, and I might add here, maybe moral rationality. The aesthetic judgment of cities and buildings is rational in as much as it operates as an immediate intuitive appreciation of performativity, short-circuiting first-hand comparative experience or extended analysis. Aesthetic judgment <laughs> thus represents an economical substitute for experience. It depends on a tra tradition that disseminates accumulated experience via extrinsic and dogmatic rules. This dogmatism is a virtue as well as the limit of aesthetically condensed intelligence. And there's a certain economy in that, in that ability to intuitively operate with dogmas, as it were, receive dogmas. But the underlying, in a historic analysis, there's an underlying kind of economic rationale which has to be um, brought to for, in, for in the analysis. For instance, the Vitruvian or Palladian <coughs> regime of proportions represents a condensation of accumulated building experience, allowing for the blind design of sound stone structures in automatic design, that's the rules you've learned. The classical orders are regulating column height to width ratios, spans, foundations, minimum roof angles for drainage, etc. The Palladian rules concerning room proportions guarantee certain standards of daylighting and air volume. Any such rule system embodies an economy of performance as well as an economy of design effort. Those regimes participate in a dogmatized science of building. Science and in inverted commas, of course. Over and above these technological principles, the aesthetic rules concerning, for instance, the Vitruvian city layout or the Palladian rules for the suburban villa enshrine and make easily reproducible specific social and, again, I might add here, moral organizations which in turn are easily read off by the trained eye, identifying, identifying the right, socially right, environment aesthetically. With the development of modern society and the availability of new building technologies, reinforced concrete, etc., and new social institutions, the classical aesthetic regime lost its rationality and became a fetter upon the further development of the built environment. What once was an accumulated wisdom became an irrational prejudice that had to be battled also on the ideological plane of aesthetic value. Um, ma materialism is able, and there are a few other examples which I've kind of in depth more articulated in, the, in an article which was published in Arch Plus, where I tried to have a similar materialist analysis of recent 20th century um, styles and aesthetic regimes, etc. And just go through very, very briefly what the scope might be of materialist analysis here. Materialism is able to explicate the seriality of modern housing, urban zoning, and the principles of specialization evident in functionalist architecture as structural aspects of the socio-economic regime of Fordism. It allows a proper assessment of modernism's historical role rather than falling for the ahistorical claim of its supposed failure in terms of human values. The usual kind of the form that criticism of modernism takes in, in um, what I might call bourgeois art history or criticism. Um, materialism also furnishes a criterion to identify the role and the rationality of postmodernism and deconstructivism within the logic of post forest restructuring. The recent return, and another example of criticism which, which one could lever from that perspective, the recent return to minimalism in architecture seems to be a rare gut move as it clings to precisely those formal orders that the logic of socioeconomic institution the development has identified as, as it, its incarcerating fetters. I mean, the rejection of complexity and, and uh, um, multiple um, forms of inhabitation, etc., which are vital in, in work process, etc., we analyze at the moment in the studio, they are kind of just thrown out of court as uh, aesthetic on the uh, basis of kind of anachronistic um, aesthetic judgments in my, in my kind of uh, analysis. The, pu and the purest... <clears throat> now, in, the, in a period of crisis and an intensified restructuring, such conservative aesthetic investment, like the minimalist, is bound to decline into a stance of defensiveness and self-victimization, which is, I think, very well known in architecture, this kind of stance is 
is a perennial one taken by the profession. And that is also just uh, on the side, a kind of primitive notion of, of morality that, that one knows what good buildings is and that one, if one isn't able to kind of force that through somehow as a, a minimalist detail, one has kind of morally failed. These are kind of the deficiencies of certain uh, 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 dogmas which are still pervasive in the profession, I think. Um, although they had their rationality in, in, in the previous mode of production of modernism, in the minimalist detail, etc., and, 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 and serial and ordered and c uh, clear, uh, clear, clear segmented, specialized kind of arrangements, etc., etc., etc. So under capitalism, uh, the purest sensibility will suffer and reject all that which comes operational, vibrant, and vital in the current transformations. Under capitalism, productive relations are still progressing, although far less than what is possible beyond this political barrier. And the new spatialities of folding, which seem to share a vocabulary with the latest drift in productive relations, point in many ways beyond class society. Dehierarchization, deterritorialization, field space, nonlinear and open networks, etc. These remarks are supposed to demonstrate how materialism offers a criterion to make a position relative to various current architectural trends. And this is also the thing which you try to do in the graduate school in this year's project, identify um, the logic of post-fortist development and trying to understand its spatial um, implications. And there is still the sense, and that is, has to be clear, it's maybe not clear to everybody. From a Marxist perspective, capitalism has been playing a progressive role. There is still progress, and within its kind of corrupt, and ultimately n by now, I think, s to be superseded logic, there, are so there, there is still progress that's going on, productive process, technological progress. And there are progressive elements one can align oneself to work with and will be, uh, uh, will be recuperable also on a higher mode of, uh, of socioeconomic organization. And I'll see this paradoxically, a lot of this taking place, or well not paradoxically, at the core as always in the, the, the development of the material force of production in terms of work organization, corporate restructuring is therefore the thing we're looking at. And uh, there are certain progressive um, uh, currencies in the debate, particularly in the, on the theoretical side, where the gurus kind of proclaim new cult corporate cultures, which, which, which share, recuperate a lot of even post-structuralist um, uh, philosophy and 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 uh, left uh, rhetoric, as it were, in, and that's what we'll be looking at. So, okay, but I'll go back to the to the te the main text. So what, so what I'm suggesting here is that aesthetic judgment might be reconstructed and redeemed as an intuitive appreciation of the vital and productive. And very good in this respect is also Tafuri's analysis of various uh, uh, transitions in the, in the history of styles on the side. On another uh, uh, level, I want to say, I give an example. The beauty of Mies Crown Hall or falling water might rest, might seem to be resting with the fantasies and anticipations we project onto the space. Its suggestiveness for, a wonderf for the wonderful encounters, productive collaborations and forms of human, human association those spaces allow us to envisage. Here such intuitions also seem to take on what one might call moral overtones. But we have to go beyond this edifying moment into the rather less comfortable territory to find out what stands in the way of those beautiful ethical anticipations. So I see that there kind of it will transpire that there, there are lots of moral sentiments around, and there is a, but there is a kind of criterion of trying to analyze to which kind of political, sociological, and, and part of production these are aligned. And there, there is a kind of criterion of this that one could distinguish regressive, <coughs> progressive, Etc. Uh, uh, sentiments and there's also something yes, w w which I would call progressive moral sentiment. Um, if aesthetic sentiments can be recuperated as moral sentiment, moral sentiment itself cannot be taken as God-given, but needs to be rationalized and recuperated within a pragmatist or rather materialist framework. This way, I could rewrite my paper on the dialectic of aesthetics and pragmatics, and would read like this, within a consistently materialist outlook, moral regimes have to be analyzed as sublimations of an underlying performativity. The moral judgment is rational inasmuch as it operates as an immediate and intuitive appreciation of social performativity, short-circuiting, first-hand comparative experience or extended analysis. Moral judgment thus represents an ec economical substitute for 
historical experience or the condensation of it. It depends on a tradi tradition that disseminates accumulated experience via extrinsic and dogmatic rules. This dogmatism is a virtue as well as the limit of pragmatic intelligence condensed into ethics. With the development of society and the availability of new technologies and organizational patterns, the classical moral regime lost its rationality and became a fetter upon the further development of the overall forces of production. What once was an accumulated wisdom became an irrational prejudice that had to be battled also on the ideological plane of moral value. So it's a kind of parallel discourse where we, where we would, would talk about static as well as moral prejudice, which have to be uh, assessed in terms of a materialist science of history, ultimately. In my analysis, the status of a whole series of moral values that guide our patterns of behavior today are exposable as factors upon the production and therefore, or currently possible production, and therefore expose as irrational the capitalist class relations upon which they depend. The best way to go beyond such a general political declaration might be to analyze and critique my own immediate political conditions of production, the concrete micro-political relations under which educational and academic institutions operate today. This might very well be seen as a challenge to the AA and my own position here. But I also know that the structure of the school is such that it cannot easily be challenged. The school does not really exist as an intellectual positioned entity. It lacks the respect of constitutional level. There is no constituted faculty which could formulate a position. This quality of unchallengeability, which is its own kind of irrational uh, um, uh, moments, or is one of the irrational moments of, of bourgeois academic organization of knowledge, uh, this quality of unchallengeability unchall pertains, of course, to the institutional structure of the school rather to any of its individual members, and any criticism of the structures here made in good faith towards all its members and the collective in nuke the school might be projected to be or become. And of course, the A is just one of a consistent type of institutions, like any other uni university now, on the one hand, or even something like the art circus on the other hand, participating in and limited by capitalist class society under the spell of imperialism. I always think class society and imperialism together, there is, it's um, class relations on a world scale and has its own uh, um, um, force. The pursuit of rigorous argument, and I go through some of the things which, which maybe you agree uh, that one experiences if one tries to teach or, or learn today. The pursuit of rigorous argument is constantly frustrated and alienated by the exchange and class relations through which we are constantly forced to exclude each other from what we are pursuing here in, academica, in academia as much and maybe much more in the profession at large. Secrecy is pervasive and obscurantist publications are nothing but another form of secrecy. Of course, I'm exaggerating maybe here, but these are for me are, are, are limits I, I feel strongly on a daily basis. Or call it spectacle as well. Any serious question or contribution perverts into an existential threat for those who are addressed as much as for those who are trying to offer it. You might not feel this as strongly as long as you are moving within a consensus. Knowledge is traded here as a career building block or career building blocks and is on the one hand sensitive property on the other, vulnerable to competitive devaluation and therefore pers and a, and personalized investment. And that p predominates over the sense of real commitment, which becomes a danger, of course, to, to, to the reproduction of, of this career. Um, and that knowledge, by that way, because the career becomes the only vehicle through the, which the knowledge is reproducible and survives. To point out that this lecture, as much as any other event or articulation of this career-building institution, is always already corrupted and alienated from its content, appears prima facie as a straightforward moral condemnation. Two remarks need to be made here to set the trajectory of the argument. First, the whole point here is to attempt a materialist reconstruction or supersession of moral judgments. 
each of these reconstructions or interpretations relies on a totalizing science of history. And you cannot always draw this out. This is just a kind of promise to a certain extent. All the obvious morally revolting aspects of class society in general and academic careerism in particular, that is leadership being based on property or bureaucratic position, the territorialism pervasive, pretentiousness, obscurantism, and the rhetorical ceiling of all the cracks and questions, etc., in written documents as well as in lectures. Um, and that is because the exchange of contribution is integrated only through the, scramble for the simultaneous scramble for privilege. And all these horrors, and that's the point here, ultimately institutionally constituted, and they are serious infringements upon production. And that is a materialist kind of uh, uh, notion or critique, ultimately. And that will also spell the, its historical limit, as it were, which I think is overdue, or its historical dimension, let's put it this way. <coughs> Contemporary moral judgments are at best intuitive reactions, in a positive sense, to the immediate social or political barriers of production and productive progress you might encounter as you do something and you're kind of upset because you can't do it because somebody else is, uh, you know, telling you not to do it or take it away from you or you already internalize this. And so these, there are certain immediate um, moral revulsions which are positive sentiments, which are most of the time, I guess, also related to that you want to do something, you want to be productive and you're made not to be. You're left not to be productive and that's frustrating. So there, there's a kind of moral sentiment which, which we have to build on to a certain extent. But they, they might also be you know, moral uh, sentiments, uh, dogmatic os ossifications of practices which are, although at some stage, former stage, historically validated, no longer conducive to the development of industrial civilization. And finally, worst, moral tenants become reactionary defense mechanisms for long since entrenched vested interest. So, the second immediate note, the institutional political barriers and limits upon serious communication and with it those patterns of intercourse which revolt us are also protected by a host of moral defenses which I would go through now. Some of the older moral defenses, traditional moral sentiments like personal loyalty, which I'm tending to translate always as kind of partners in crime relative to vested interests, or reverence to seniority, although these kind of notions, loyalty, reverence to seniority, might, might still have a waning force, they might nevertheless safely be assumed to be on the way out. This is the whole kind of trauma for, for real conservatives, which, which talk about the loss which capitalism engenders upon their moral universe. But I'm kind of glad that they, they let's assume them to be on the way out. What one rather has to focus on and challenge at this moment are those seemingly modern or rather postmodern values which appear less contentious, appear even progressive. Sentiments like the celebration of difference, pluralism, the liberal tolerance, this comes with a half-acknowledged relativism, the value of academic autonomy, the dogmatic or bureaucratic independence of all researchers or teachers, as well as of all students from each other, an institutional culture which allows only an imminent criticism. I mean, the independence of the students is, don't tell me, this is none of your business, what I'm supposed to draw, you know. This kind of stuff. But it's, of course, between the teachers, is, is, is equally uh, sensitive to, to criticize. We all, we all understand. And uh, <coughs> the, um, okay, pluralism, the liberal tolerance, the value of academic uh, um, autonomy, the independence of all teachers, the rejection of substantial leadership, the fetish fetishization of individualism, individuality and the so-called personal, intellectual, artistic interests, the fetishistic respect for authorship, and the forced invisibility of anonymous collective work, etc. All these wonderful moral values, again, pluralism, tolerance, autonomy, independence, individuality, and I have to make a bit kind of a, a relativation. While participating in the contradictory fusion of progressive post-Fordism and regressive neoliberalism, and I can't go into this now in detail. <laughs> and of course, and that's important, but 
having to be defended against any looming authoritarianism from above, any critique from, from kind of older uh, traditions. Nevertheless, they have to be criticized, in my terms, from below, that is, from the vantage point of a radicalized notion of democracy, a notion of democracy that does respect the wholly arbitrary and crippling definition of a public versus a private domain, as little as the equally arbitrary and increasingly ineffectual national definition of the public as the unit of societal self-determination. So you see two absolutely arbitrary limits upon democ democratic discourse. The, a massive private uh, realm, which, which includes uh, uh, heads of corporations doing infinitely uh, uh, relevant decisions, as well as, of, uh, uh, as, as, as uh, the public only defined through on a national level and, and nothing else is countered. Everything uh, is always in the political realm a national interest. These need to be challenged. There are, there. So both these limits of the public democratic domain need to be challenged in the respect of moral cloak, and that comes along quite strongly, respect for privacy and patriotism, private that is, and national self-determination, those dogmas remain amongst the most powerful ideological bulwarks of class society and imperialism. Okay. Um, but it seems again I'm jumping to conclusions too, quick, too quickly and uh, I introduce notions or an agenda which can no longer be taken for granted today as being self-evident. And it's also striking for me that, that a lot of what I've been saying would have been self, seemed to be self-evident in, in, in the 70s, looking back at, at a lot of the literature and the hegemony of Marxism in, in academic discourse. But, um, therefore, let me go back, as it were, and build my argument by picking up the question of morality from where bourgeois politics and, uh, and academic discourse has left it. The question of ethics and morality, how should we live, behave, interact with each other, commit ourselves to each other, etc., might initially be approached empirically or even on a personal level. It seems as if through the further questioning of what one finds historically or empirically, or even through one's personal dilemmas, one sooner or later feels compelled to enter what one might be inclined to call the plane of philosophical reflection. But most of us, for most of us, this is tricky territory, and it seems as if one would have to rest with ultimately unaccountable stipulations or beliefs. And that has to be challenged also. That's how I feel, that's who I am. And this is indeed what a considerable part of the Anglo-Saxon philosophical tradition, even in the 20th century, settled for. Or was particular in the 20th century, actually. Morality and ultimate values are to a large extent seen to be outside the domain of rational inquiry and critique a position which, by the way, rests comfortably with an increasingly privatizing society. This wholly agnostic and defeatist stance results theoretically from the narrow conception and artificial isolation of the issue and discipline of moral philosophy. From this perspective, one might start to distinguish the various modes of philosophical analysis in respect to the scope of phenomena that would uh, enter the analysis of morality. A lot of the latter-day Oxford philosophy on ethics starts and concludes with nothing more than the analysis of language use. Some moral philosophies would include references to biology or psychology or the psychology of everyday life. Some include a certain degree of historical reflection or abstract reflections, very abstract, about the liberal democratic state. Um, but ultimately, moral philosophy ends up insisting on its own original turf, formulating abstract and eternal criteria of evaluation. Utilitarianism, contractualism, consequentialism, emotivism, etc. These are treated as, as a kind of disciplinary uh, uh, territory, or the outcome of such speculation. According to my previous definition, this is philosophy only by name, a closure of discipline which itself can be brought to task only through a totalizing philosophy like Marxism. And to a large extent, I think uh, 20th century philosophy in particular resolves itself into Marxism without being acknowledged. But we are suffering at the moment quite a severe backlash and 
unfortunately, on that level. What would be required here is a systematic historical analysis of socio-economic relations. But with, within bourgeois academia, such an inquiry is consigned to another department, which in turn, as it touches on moral issues from within its own trajectory, receives abstract and eternal moral truths as bulwark against the radical thrust of its own rationality. That's the way instant economics and moral discourse lock each other into the conservative taking for granted of capitalist uh, systems of relations, in my analysis. This kind of constriction of reflection to a circumscribed area of supposed relevance and expertise achieves a conservative mutual deadlock. This is a general hallmark of bourgeois academic discourse. But nowhere is the irrationality of these constrictions more evident than concerning the fundamental questions of ethics how to relate to each other, that is, how to organize our materially independent lives. But that's not the way they see, see that. They think they can isolate a kind of moral truth, ahistorically, apolitically. What bourgeois philosophy seems to be lacking is even the inkling that what is required to answer this question is nothing short of a totalizing science of economic history that reflects and cons reconstructs moral categories and cultural patterns in respect to the evolving conditions of total social material reproduction on a world scale. As witnessed here in this lecture series three weeks ago, and I refer to Chantal Mouffe, uh, bourgeois academia, and I include her now in it, although she has been pro proposed herself as a radical left, and the ra being on the kind of radical left 10 years ago. Bourgeois academia thinks it possible to contribute to what it calls political theory, ahistorically as well as apolitically, that is, without any reference to the latest socio-economic and political developments, post fordism neoliberalism, globalization, hegemony of international capital over nationally organized labor, etc., etc. Nothing of the kind was referred to, and refusing to draw conclusions of any kind in the form of a political position, and thus leaving all its terms forever indeterminate and undecisive. And that's what uh, uh, exposes for me this kind of writing is utterly on the one hand, a waste of time, on the other hand, um, um, an ideological maneuver. But th th that's not Chantal Mou's problem. That's the problem of, of the, the way uh, knowledge is organized under capitalism. But bourgeois society lacks much more than the right insight. It rather has long since become itself an irredeemable obstacle to the constitution of the transcendental subject, that is, the democratic discourse, through which alone the necessary theoretical synthesis, this totalizing science of history, can emerge. Within the Marxist discourse, those incarcerating disciplinary boundaries and the political limits of discourse are materially challenged, in practice as well as in theory. The explosion of these limits is one of the founding moments of this radically different intellectual paradigm and practice which crucially fuses theoretical work with political work. The vitality and intellectual breakthrough of this paradigm into which philosophical reflection is transposed and brought to task depends inalienable on its alignment and synthesis with a new political force, the global industrial working class and the hypothesis and promise of international communism. Marx and Engels elaborate the crucial breakthrough towards the science of history in the process of and through the involvement with the organization of the first international and later the second international, and as well as the Social Democratic Party, and their insights could not have come to maturity out of this, outside of this engagement. They had to face serious questions on a daily level from relevant uh, 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 political and practical forces. Something which any uh, bourgeois intellectualist de systematically deprives himself of. Once stated, it is for me irresistible and self-evident that philosophy and science can only fulfill their ambition through an alignment with the forces of resistance from the very bottom of society, which due to their very position are bound to constitute themselves democratically and can only proliferate through univer universalizing movement. This is the inherent uh, democracy of, of the labor movement comes from, from, from this logic. It is, it, it's kind of selection criterion on proliferation is its permanent universalizing and democratizing 
thrust uh, and not uh, the initial intelligence of the worker, of course. It's a, it's a structural logic which is inherently progressive and democratic and can only come from below. <coughs> what transpires here, despite all the impurities and contradictions that might be set any concrete struggle, is something that indeed was already demonstrated by the dynamic of 18th century enlightenment. The irresistible epistemological thrust of what Lenin calls the universal class. And the bourgeoisie for a moment of transition of ascendance was that universal class, universalizing, proliferated through universalization. In order to mediate these insights for you, I might have to go back and take on bourgeois morality and philosophical moral reflection at its most sophisticated, profound and edifying elaboration as it is articulated in the work of Kant. So I'll spend some time on Kant's moral philosophy. Kant seems to have given the conclusive formalization of the fundamental principles of bourgeois morality. A morality we still inhabit as might transpire through the edifying force of Kant's exposition, which I think it still has. What will also transpire is that certain key moments in this reflection already be point beyond the bourgeois order. Those moments are a reflection of the universalizing logic of the bourgeois ascendance from below and are as such recuperable for a more radically democrat democratizing movements. Other moments of bourgeois liberation have now to be analyzed as moments of containment. Kant's moral discourse is in many ways the culmination of 18th century philosophical work, developing in the context, and I'm again trying to give a kind of historical materialist <coughs> account of um, Kant's work while recuperating moments which, uh, which I still commit myself to. Kant's moral discourse in many ways the culmination of 18th century philosophical work, developing in the context of the proliferating sciences on the one hand and the emerging capitalist economic and political relations on the other hand. And capitalism was inherently, was progressive at that stage. Relative, it's always relative to, to the feudal order. It, it broke through and unleashed an enormous productive potential. The very notion of a principled formal investigation, which Kant offers, <coughs> of the total system of moral categories against and above a mere empirical engagement with particular moral tenets, this is most clearly brought to bear in Kant's critique. Such a project significantly, significantly suspends initially all traditional values and precepts and in this respect ca can become a force in alignment with the dynamic of emergent capitalism and modernization which cuts through a lot of traditional uh, moralities. In his famous text from 1784, What is Enlightenment? Kant takes self-determination as the ultimate a priori of practical life. The criterion of everything that can be agreed upon, that's a quote, the criterion of everything that can be agreed upon as a law by a people lies in this question. Can a people impose such a law on itself? This self-determination requires the free use of public reason, this is all explicit in Kant, which is therefore treated as a priori of any enlightened civil society. At the bottom of it, one finds in Kant, and that is usually not brought out that clearly, I guess, the notion of progress. Any specific order is provisional. Any attempt to freeze, even by contract, any social order or law is, according to Kant, impossible and in contradiction to the notion of self-determination. I quote again, such a contract whose intention is to preclude forever, and what he's describing is in a way something which we all inhabit, eternalized uh, constitutions, anybody criticizing regarded and hounded down as an enemy of the Constitution, whether it's America, particularly in Germany. It's interesting to, 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 to in this respect, to read that, that quote of Kant. Um, such a contract, whose intention is to preclude forever all further enlightenment of the human race, is absolutely null and void, even if it would be ratified by parliaments. One age cannot bind itself and thus conspire to place a succeeding one in, contradict, con in a condition whereby it would be impossible for the later age to expand its knowledge. 
that would be a crime against human nature whose essential destiny lies precisely in such progress. Subsequent generations are thus completely justified in dismissing such agreements as unauthorized and criminal. A radical reading of Kant would construct from this commitment, from this a commitment to permanent revolution, whereby the only dogma would be the insistence of absolute anti-dogmatism, the only categorical constitutional prerogative would be defined through the constitutional conditions of further progress. The protection of unrestricted public reason, the only exclusion from its universalizing thrust would be the exclusion of the excluders. The only limit of freedom is the logic of freedom itself. And we'll get later uh, to explicate what that logic is. Uh, implies. In the following I want to trace how this enlightenment as bourgeois enlightenment turns into its opposite. The radical character of the bourgeoisie pertains only to its movement from below. But this movement soon becomes contradictory inasmuch as it, while still moving forward against the feudal order and the aristocracy, already engages in a rearguard movement of containing the lower orders in the very process or soon after. This <coughs> rearguard aspect becomes more pronounced as the bourgeoisie consolidates its power, also through striking a deal and compromise with sections of the aristocracy. But let me try to rehearse and historically interpret in detail the logic of morality which Kant articulates at this historical juncture. I will reverse the order of Kant's presentation and the groundwork of the metaphysics of morals, very much to be recommended. Uh, and start with what he ends with, namely freedom and free will as the most fundamental promise of morality, or premise, sorry. Before elaborating Kant's notion, I want to pose Marx's reminder to remain in the back of our minds that the freedom the bourgeoisie stands for has also an economic rationale. The freedom of labor from the feudal bond to become freely hireable and fireable the freedom to choose one's profession, the freedom to buy or sell anything including land, free markets and free trade. In a formulation closest to Kant's discourse, one would say the freedom to engage freely in relations by contract. And this freedom is progressive at a certain stage. It becomes regressive and an obstacle for further democratization. In the name, yeah which is then called the freedom to, to privately engage in, in massive operations. In the groundwork, or nationally, in, in, in devastating operations. In the groundwork, Kant analyzes a network of related terms. Freedom, morality, autonomy, universality, and reciprocity. As dependent upon each other, as each other's necessary presupposition. Some of Kant's reconstructions seem prima facie counterintuitive. But I would second his claim that he adds nothing that is not already implicit within ordinary modern moral judgment. Freedom, he claims, exists only within and through the rational self subjection to a self imposed universal moral maxim or law. Freedom is the very opposite of that state where we do as we please and fancy. Freedom of the will can only exist where we are free from empirical and contingent moods, inclinations and desires. I quote Kant, it is just this freedom from dependence on interested motives, for otherwise we would have to be regarded as subject only to the law of nature, the law of our own needs. I would emphasize the, the, the thing of being compelled by vested special interests, which is the kind of limit of, of, of freedom. Any need you are able to universalize is by that very notion, notion you're no longer um, 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 shackled by. The free act is thus the act which demonstrates the resistance to natural determination through rational volition. That is his position. It is clear that the criterion of such conduct can only be absolute selflessness, and thus points towards the necessary moral dimension of freedom. 
only if I determine my will and action on the basis of a universal moral law which is essentially defined through the exclusion of any personal or special interest can I be sure that my actions are free. <coughs> that I can test the necessary universality of the underlying maxim of my action and I can test the necessary universality of the underlying maxim of my action by posing the question of the consistency of my will relative to an assumed universal reciprocity. Re reciprocity sorry. Kant poses this criterion as a categorical Im imperative of practical reason. I quote, Act only on that maxim through which you can at the same time will that it should become a universal law. This imperative obviously avo avoids any specific moral tenet. It neither defines the moral act through its results. It furnishes a formal criterion for moral qualifications. The possible universality of its principle. The most convincing and recurring example Kant gives relates to the capitalist institution of credit. What he means is really a, the question of a consistency within universalization as the criterion of any moral category. And that is, that is in capitalism makes sense and that's uh, the example of, of credit shows this. Um, he demonstrates that any maxim that would allow me in moments of existential need to resort to the borrowing of money without the full ability and commitment to the promise of paying back is self-contradictory since such an allowance, if universalized, would dissolve the very institution of borrowing I want to rely on. And I quote, it would make promising and the very purpose of promising itself impossible since no one would believe he was being promised anything, but laugh at the utterances of this kind as empty shams. Abstract universality is the, so, uh, is the form social rules of intercourse have to take in the anonymous mass society of capitalism. Personal relations no longer stretch far enough. In this light one might read the following statement which relates morality to abstract rational beings and excludes reference to any notion of allegiance to specific human, cultural or national qualities of character. I quote, the practically good is that which determines the will by concepts of reason and therefore not by subjective causes, but objectively, that is on the ground, grounds valid for every rational being as such. This reflects, in my analysis, materialist analysis of it, and critique of it, no recuperation of it. This reflects the need of capitalist anonymous mass society with personal relation, where personal relations have been re replaced by abstract money relations, where strangers enter the market of exchange and contractual obligation without personal loyalty, bondage or means of coercion. The universality of bourgeois morality depends historically on the universality of money relations superseding feudal loyalty. The, freedoms, the freedom presupposed, and therefore it doesn't make sense to stick the feudal, uh, to, 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 to loyalty as the, as the operative uh, um, uh, moral category which organizes social relations at that historical stage anymore. The freedom presupposed by bourgeois morality is the freedom of the capitalist market. Again, superseding feudal bondage. In bourgeois morality and law, freedom of will and free choice of action is a precondition for being guilty and accountable, also not to be taken for granted in, in, at any historical stage. This is what Kant starts with. The only good or evil is the good or evil will rather than the results of action. Such a sophisticated practice of validation and sanction which requires an inquiry into the underlying intention operates as a more productive mode of social regulation, appropriate for a more complex social organization, but also presupposing a relatively generalized regularity of life conditions, of law, and knowledge of the law and adherence to it, etc. Okay, what these remarks should hint at 
is the possibility to explain notions of morality as modes of social regulation relative to historically attained relations of production. And they're not by that very matter eo ipso uh, out of force. That analysis doesn't stop there. Some of these, these, these have to be superseded, others, others in their original logic are, uh, are recuperable. But so far, my remarks set the bourgeois morality off against the older feudal order. So far, those principles of bourgeois morality seem now uncontentious and recuperable in a socialist society. Universality, reciprocity, and the presupposition of freedom. The first thing one would have to say here is that capitalist class society and imperialism consistently and substantially fall short of delivering even the explicitly bourgeois <laughs> ideals of justice, universal recipro reciprocity, universal rule of law, exposed through the universal and free use of public deliberation, equality before the law, equality of rights and opportunity, etc. My claim here is that capitalist class society that is the system of private property of the means of production and the private appropriation of the results of combined and integrated production is a systematic obstacle to the realization of those rational ideals. This was already clearly understood by Trotsky and Lenin who realized that the bourgeoisie under imperialism could no longer universalize its own revolution that the bourgeoisie outside the advanced imperialist core, that is also the Russian bourgeoisie at this stage, could no longer fulfill the historical task even of the classical bourgeois revolutions. They, Lenin and Trotsky themselves, had to take over and move through this stage. On a political level, theories of economic liberalism, of perfect and purely economic, that is, productive competition, have to be exposed as ideological in as much as they consistently fail to analyze and acknowledge the systematic drive towards monopoly and the systematic instrumentalization of the national state against the principle of a universally regulated world market for capital, goods and labor against true economic ec competition. So what I'm trying to argue here at the moment is that the bourgeois ideology, ideology of, uh, and rationality which is proclaimed by economic science, if you think it through, is something which, which is uh, pertaining to an older stage in capitalism, that capitalism moves continuously against that. And I think even, even this, I say this even though neoliberalism seems to have a kind of ascendance recently. The ideological nature of neoliberal discourse is exposed in its hypocrisy, aligning themselves and systematically failing to indict the very forces of imperialism, exemplified by Thatcher and Reagan and their heirs, which are actively utilizing all the possibilities of diplomatic and military competition, which cru crucially also excludes the restriction of movement and immigration through the establishment of police national borders. I'm just saying that the, the world we're looking at has nothing to do with what the neoliberals wanted to be. Do to be, which is a pure rational competition on, on, the, on the basis of, of productive intelligence and capacity, which would regulate wonderfully uh, uh, the, the total social good. That we are, and what, what this discourse uh, uh, does, is in this sense ideological, that it absolutely fails to recognize that the very forces that kind of furnish the ideology of war are, are continuously operating against that, and we living in the stage of a militarized imperialist economy to the point that, yes, like Trotsky already uh, was very clear about, the bourgeoisie can no longer even uh, provide and expand and universalize its own um, initial uh, uh, liberation and, and, and uh, liberal democracy uh, outside very, very narrow core heartlands. And even there, I would be, I would be, I would be very skeptical. Um, Okay, so that, that is a, taking bourgeois ideals as they are and seeing what, uh, on the, what, what capitalism, how capitalism does in terms of delivering those. But the second thing, beyond the question of 
who can deliver the bourgeois ideals, one would have to say that Marxism also proposes a substantial critique of the essence of bourgeois morality and justice. The abstractness and formal character of universal bourgeois right allows for and legitimizes substantial material inequalities. Bourgeois equality of treatment is understood as equality of treatment of people in equal positions, allowing for extreme material differences and differences in the power of decision making, as long as in the abstract or in principle no one is excluded from access to any of those positions. For each according to his or her due relates to the principle of private economic exchange where any contribution to the integrated production process has to individually negotiate and extract its remuneration. That's for me the capitalist system and that's the morality. Of for each according to his due means you have to make sure that you get your share out of it. As you contribute, you have to, you have to hedge in and claim and run after your remuneration. At a certain stage, that is again not clear when is a stage transgressed, but I think we're long, we're long across a threshold there. At a certain stage of development, it might be worthwhile to speculate at least about the rationality or overall efficiency of this process of production slash distribution where every productive effort engenders and imposes, has imposed upon it a universal scramble for privilege and perennial efforts to secure legally protect and police the always precarious means of private survival. And the more, under post-Fordism, economic relations become fluid, the more time and energy has to be spent on re-establishing permanently and renegotiating the various differential private claims upon the results of production. The capitalist system is forced by threat of total stoppage and everybody knows who's working and hasn't, there isn't a contract signed which tries to but never can fully determine which of the bits and pieces o are owned by who. Um, and this becomes an incredible, uh, I think, waste of energy and time. And um, so the capitalist system is forced by threat of stoppage to relentlessly and unambiguously determine the private ownership for any economic move and particle within the complex and long since global web of interdependent productive activities. And including, that is important to mention maybe here, including intellectual production. Even supposed political criticism becomes just another vehicle for a career. The reproduction of a career within a power infested system becomes the external validation and selection criterion directing and perverting discourse under the spell of capitalism. But that goes also, uh, yeah, for every, for every uh, contribution which is also done manually, it, it, is, it, is, it is always already alienated from, from its purpose and driven by another, by another logic. The resources going into this unproductive effort, this shadow economy as you might call it, of differential distribution, might be counted as costs imposed by the social system of capitalism. This unproductive economy comprises large parts of the state administration, foreign office, the judiciary, the whole legal profession, or large parts of it, the police, the penal system, tax administration, the banking system, most part of it, the whole military, all private security services and systems, etc., etc. The percentage of total labor of those activities must be substantial. This is, a, this is the light in which materialism asks us to evaluate the communist proposal to replace the capitalist to each according to his due with the principle from each according to ability to each according to need where we, where we might have the luxury to try and think through what would happen if one cuts out this obsession with, with nailing down who's getting what. The fetishistic notion, because the costs are enormous as far as I'm concerned, the, fet the fetishistic notion of justice is thrown out of court here in this argument. Although the new regulatory principle will also attain the status of justice as an internalized rationality. The more and more irrational capitalist insistence and obsession with rightful property 
derives its legitimacy from the originally rational and plausible but long since gone economy of individual or family producers exchanging their products in the market. Beyond the mounting of directly professionalized unproductive labor, lawyers, police, etc., penal, penal, penal uh, uh, judges, the capitalist imposition of the scramble for privilege potentially distracts and distorts all productive efforts from the productive rationale that makes work effective <coughs> only as integrated work under current conditions and long since. Under capitalism, producers are always induced to keep knowledge in reserve and the need to continuously hedge in productive capacity and information, ex and, information and thus act as a barrier of communication and scientific progress. The materialist question of socialism or communism concerns the conditions and prospects of radical egalitarian democracy and its potential ability to sustain and propel the next stage in the development of global industrial civilization. And to pose this question, ultimately on the level of the world economic system, is not hubris, but the inevitable and really real context for any practical reflection. And that's why I find George Fiori's uh, uh, seminar extremely important in this, in this school. And uh, you should all uh, take uh, the benefit of, of joining. In the last section, there's just uh, uh, one last kind of turn of the argument which brings us uh, close to epistemological questions. In the last section of the lecture, I want to make the distinction between historically arguable and materialistically questionable moralities, which we've gone through quite a few, and the always already practical, and if you like, the moral, or I prefer, the political principle, which is the precondition and implicit presupposition of materialism or Marxism, and cannot be questioned within Marxist discourse, or any other discourse for that matter. This principle, which is already contained in Kant's discourse, and is the historical achievement of the Enlightenment, in this sense, I'm still seeing myself wholly in the, in the tradition of the Enlightenment, is the principle of undiscriminatory access to public reason and exposure of any practical or truth claim to the unrestrained public critique. The principle reflects and poses the practical and political condition of the very institution of discourse and science. That is the essence of discourse ethics of Habermas and Carlotto Apel, which was the central target of Chantal Mouffe's critique here three weeks ago. However much the ideological abuses of this approach, which also exist, might merit critique, Chantal Mouffe failed to allow us to understand the more fundamental thrust of this insight, which for me becomes one more and maybe the fundamental element of the necessary and urgent critique of capitalism. The very institution of science and rationality already embodies and implies a whole series of historically achieved and battled for moral positions. The rejection, that's first, of authority and hierarchy in the establishment of truth and knowledge but more and more of our production is just about that. Research, innovation, truth and knowledge and becomes an ever more barrier. And that's why the corporations understand that and, and experiment with single set status, no hierarchy, but continuously run against the limit imposed by the, by, by the need to, to, to privately appropriate in the end finally and reserve uh, uh, the right of unquestioned decision. So that's the first. The non-discriminatory and universal access to discourse, which is embodied in the scientific requirement of universal reproduci reproducibility of a scientific effect, and is preconditioned to enter the, as a precondition of any uh, effect or, or knowledge, piece of knowledge, to enter the body of scientific knowledge. Everybody who is, knows methodology, the reproducibility is is the criterion, and and it obviously re relies on on uh, universal access to, 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 to testing. Um, the absence of involvement of any vested or special interest in the scientific inquiry. Any suspicion here suspends the results of any inquiry until impartial procedures are ensured. 
The philosophical distinction between questions of fact and value stops here, where the very institution of fact establishing relies and presupposes a democratic politics, which drives us to communism ultimately. Any suspicion of power relations existing between participants of a discussion a priori devalues and annuls any outcome of the discussion. And I'm sure we would all agree with that. That's the way we, 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 we would assess uh, truth values. Even those in power would not know if their argument really is valid or just succeeds through intimidation. Under such conditions, nobody gains knowledge. This is, by the way, a serious problem for corporate as well as bourgeois academic rationality, where power presides and the necessary drift has been towards dehierarchization and democratization, as well in universities, but always compromised by what is possible under the capitalist class system, which exposes it one more time as an inherent obstacle to science and progress. This is not so much evident in the politically um, uncontentious natural sciences, but all the more obvious in the social sciences of psychology, history, economics, and politics. And I think that in terms of uh, uh, technological and civilatory progress, the, the political discourse is much more urgent, also for me becomes very clear in George's uh, class, much more urgent uh, uh, than, than uh, what we have, have to gain for, or we have to gain much more to make progress here than what we might be able to gain in, in the next level of, of technology, because we just had in a massive technological revolution, the microelectronic revolution, but, but uh, coupled with the kind of very, very much contained uh, and, 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 and conservative political regime under which this is uh, uh, happening. And uh, uh, in my argument, a big contradiction is, is building up here. Um, so under capitalism, which continuously cuts the already materially fully integrated and existentially interdependent world population into opposed vested interests, the evident question of the shared interest of an efficient world production, which is of course no zero-sum game, cannot even be theoretically posed, never mind comprehensively discussed. Even less, of course, are there means of implementing any possible recommendation of such deliberation. It just simply doesn't exist. All decisions are atomized and have to reckon with the total agglomeration of decisions as an alien and an unconscious force. As Marx put, puts it, mankind has not yet attained self-consciousness. It is a slave and remains a slave of its own blind social processes, has not yet moved from prehistory to history, that is the active and conscious making of history. The transition to history in this sense is the most profound promise of world communism. And the hypothesis that the real takeoff of productive, scientific, and cultural development still lies in front of us beyond the threshold of a social, socialist world revolution. And I believe that this is, in terms of potentiality, there's an enormous rush of development possible, stored up behind, as it were, the threshold of, of socialist revolution. It might, might be very well worth of investing one's personal kind of leftover time in entertaining the, the, those, those, those fru fru fruits of collective um, um, democratic, democratized production. The fundamental problem is that capitalism does not even allow the systematically and systematically prevents the full theoretical elabora elaboration of socioeconomic and political possibilities. All research is funded and aimed towards the calculation of vested and partial interests which never allow their privileged position to be questioned and therefore always take the class system and imperialist world system unquestioned for granted as absolute as if a naturally given limit of speculation. The Labour Party, as any other political party in this world, institutionalizes only the wholly arbitrary, historically given level of the interests of the citizens of this island, the holy arbitrary national level is the only institutionalized, the only apparently thinkable level through which one can articulate and align an interest, articulate an interest, think an interest. 
as if the interests of us here are only definable as British interests. Even the level, and that is by also another level of vested interest and, and partial interest, even the level of entering into an institutional acknowledgement of interests we might have as Europeans, never mind wor as world citizens, is put under the strictly short-term precondition that the entering of the new alignment Europe safeguards British privileges at, at any point, and therefore that, that even hasn't been achieved. Even that kind of, uh, uh, let's say, slightly higher level of vested interest is, is, is continuously falling to pieces. Therefore, the new game never gets off the ground and acts a threshold denying the take of, uh, of the, what I would call the non-zero-sum game of world economic democracy. That's it.